Hi. Okay, so uh, I think we'll just start now. Okay. Okay. Hey everybody, um, I'm Clarence. Uh, today the session will be about machine learning. Uh, just to uh, get a got a quick sense of the of the room. How many of you have worked with machine learning before? Okay, so that's that's a good number. How many of you have used uh, one of those machine learning AV softwares before? Okay, that's not a lot. Uh, pretty good sign. So. Um, this talk is about how to uh, bypass machine learning systems, and uh, it's still a little bit early in the in the whole ecosystem now. I think machine learning has started to become uh, a big buzzword in an, in the last few years. Um, what I was curious to know was how many companies are using these terms, like uh, you know, deep learning, um, adversarial machine learning, uh, adaptive systems, to try to market their products. If you've been to expo floors at big security conferences, you, you would have seen at least a dozen companies claiming to do something crazy. So what I did was I just uh, scraped the, the short snippets of company descriptions at these expos, uh, mainly RSA and Black Hat, to, uh, to see how many, how many companies actually claim to do such things. And there's an interesting trend over the years. From 2012 to 2015, you can see a pretty, pretty large increase uh, from about 4 to 24 at its peak. 2016, it kind of died down a little bit, maybe because people started realizing that it's actually bullshit. So, um, I have a quick short demo to, to show what machine learning can do and how a system that uses machine learning for image recognition is actually bypassed. Um, this is actually a, a check uh, reader. So in the 1990s, uh, there used to be some pretty janky technology that uses deep learning to recognize digits uh, on checks that you would write to your bank because uh, the quantity of checks that the bank would receive would be so large that it was just impossible for human tellers to do all the work. So um, these these machines would basically scan the checks and then read these numbers that were basically handwritten digits and try to parse out the digits from them. So um, here I have two examples of, of checks. Um, one is a normal one and one is the adver adversary example which is supposed to generate the wrong out output through a deep learning system. And so I've just like a short piece of code using a model that I've, I've pre-trained uh, prototype.checkpoint and what this does is just basically extract the digits out from the check. Um, it's a very naive example. I'm just taking a particular area of, of, of the scan image and then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm passing this each digit through the model and then the model will, be, will basically tell me if this is a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. So um, I'm just running the code Python readcheck.py fill check norm. Um, this loads the model from uh, from what I previously tra trained, and it reads the digits nine three seven eight zero zero, which is if you actually look at the the image itself, uh, makes sense nine three seven eight dot zero zero. Okay, and so let's run it through another an, another image um, fill check adv. And so this image looks looks pretty pretty similar. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll show you again later. But then the digits that it reads for using the same model is actually different. Let's check it to see uh, how different it looks again. So this is the adversarial image. It says 9378.00. A human will be able to read it as such. But uh, it actually gives the, a different result. So that's just uh, a quick teaser of, of, of what this presentation is going to be about. Um, adversarial machine learning is a field that's, that's still actively in research. There's papers published almost every week in this area. Uh, researchers mainly in Google Brain, OpenAI, and the uh, University of Pennsylvania um, are working on this. So what does it mean to, to hack machine learning? I, I think uh, a lot of you in this room are, are, are what we consider hackers. I, I think um, you have strong infosec skills. You, you, you like to do stuff. You, you like to actually, actually make things break. Um, and so I think that the security industry needs to move in, in the direction of, of statistics and machine learning because more and more systems in the world uh, rely on machine learning uh, for critical 
purposes. So if you can think of self-driving cars, if you think of some security systems that make use of the adaptive properties of machine learning to detect polymorphism in the adversaries, um, a lot of things that we rely on in the world are slowly becoming more intelligent and starting to rely on machine learning. So if we want to effectively evaluate the security principles and the vulnerabilities of such systems, the security industry needs to gather the, the relevant skills to, to do that. So deep learning is not a, it's not a new toy at all. It's developed uh, in 1943, actually, and like many things, it was developed by funding from the DoD. The reason why it's so popular now is because there's just much more data everywhere. Um, the amount of data that we're generating in the last two years, I think, uh, if you remember this very popular anecdote, um, is greater than the amount of data that we generated as a whole civilization um, bit prior to that. And it's revived due to impl uh, improvements in computational hardware. Deep learning or neural networks or any kind of machine learning actually is very computationally intensive because it's uh, a, a pretty brute force method of computing intelligence. Uh, with GPUs, for example, you can you can compute um, multiple concurrent matrix operations uh, concurrently, and um, this just greatly improves the speed at which you can generate intelligence with machine learning. And there's a popular myth that deep learning is modeled after how the human brain works. Um, I think this is this is great marketing, you know, like if if you can if you can code up the human brain, then uh, of course uh, the possibility that a machine can achieve human sentience is uh, much greater than before. But uh, we'll come to see that actually deep learning is much simpler than what we what we think the human brain is. And actually, do we really know how the human brain works? Uh, I'd argue no. And I think a lot of research shows that there's no um, there, there, there's no agreeable way that the human brain works that researchers can can really uh, conclude upon. So deep learning is everywhere. Machine learning is everywhere. If I think all of us have interacted with deep learning systems at such such point, if not at every day in our lives. Um, who uses Google now or or Siri or some or some kind of uh, speech recognition software on a daily basis? Okay, that's that's a good proportion. I, I think. Um, I tried to use Siri a lot in the past, but then it's it started to to uh, not really work well. Um, and there are some papers uh, there are some papers that describing the way that speech recognition works today and and why as it learns the human's ability to 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 enunciate words, the speech recognition model actually breaks down more and more. So machine learning isn't a monotonically Im improving uh, piece of software. If the, if the improvements encoded inside the machine learning model are not uh, are not actively being managed by a human or being actively uh, processed and, and pruned, then actually the the efficacy of such software is um, is is it, it can go down. Self-driving cars, for example, are also a very popular application of deep learning. Um, most self-driving cars are just made up of certain sensors and 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 the cam cameras. So what this does, it just takes the surroundings as input and it tries to recognize objects. And object recognition is one of the core capabilities of deep learning. What it does is it just takes in an image and it tries to recognize any object uh, in taking in arbitrary pixels. Um, in about March of this year, uh, the the World Go champion, the, the board game Go, was beaten by Google's, Google's DeepMind, which is based off a deep learning algorithm using LSTMs, and we'll go a bit more into that later. Um, some security uh, systems have also famously used deep learning to, to achieve pretty, pretty good results. An example is Invincia's malware detection system. Um, this uses some kind of, you know, pretty, pretty iffy uh, graph, um, graph processing algorithms to, to detect malware, detect clusters of activity. So why would someone choose to use deep learning over just traditional machine learning? Or when I say traditional machine learning, I'm, I'm referring to things like linear regressors. I'm referring to things like SVMs or, or uh, clustering algorithms. Um, the primary reason is because deep learning uh, represents uh, a way of automatic feature learning. So what that means is that if you have an input, let's say you have an image, and th and this image consists of of pixels, and each of these pixels contains maybe RGB values between zero and two fifty five. How do you select the relevant features uh, to feed into this model? Uh, 
a big problem in machine learning is dimensionality reduction. And the reason we do dimensionality reduction is, number one, because of efficiency. If you were to learn every single uh, feature of, of every single input that you feed into the model, then your model will be very inefficient. So there must be some decision points in any particular input that would help the model make the same decision as it would have um, if a human were to look at an image and recognize that um, this nine is a nine because there is a circle in uh, on the top and then there is a curve from the right to the left um, on on the on the right of that circle. And deep learning also presents one infrastructure for multiple problems, sort of. Um, if you think of other machine learning models, you kind of have to write different pieces of code to try different pieces to, to to work on different problems. And deep learning represents a single infrastructure, which is just a multi-layered uh, neuron network. And uh, this can promise to solve many different kinds of problems with just one piece of code. And also with problems becoming larger and larger, you can perform hierarchical learning and distribute this workload among different nodes and, and, and across an entire cluster, uh, which also presents itself as a very alluring um, benefit to using deep learning over some other algorithm like uh, clustering algorithms that cannot be efficiently distributed. But it's definitely not one size fit all as, as we'll come to see. So this is what a standard neural net looks like. Um, this is a 453 neural net architecture. 453 simply means it's a three layer network because it's 4, 5, and 3. And the first layer has four input units. The second layer, which is the hidden layer, has five units. And the, the last layer, which is the output layer, has three units. So what each of these units are, they're just activation functions. They can be very simple linear functions. Any kind of function that basically allows you to turn um, the, the unit on and off. So one of the most common functions is uh, just a sigmoid function, which just means that if it is below, uh, if the value of, of, of the input is below zero, then the output will be zero. If the value of the input function is above zero, then the output will be non-zero, it will be positive. And so let's just zoom in on one particular path, which is the important one. Um, every time you input uh, a feature vector into a neural net. It will run through the input layer. It will activate the activation function. And then each link between layers will have a weight W associated with it. And um, when this is passed through the input layer and goes to the second layer, it will basically be multiplied by the weight and a bias will be added to it. And this will go through the network uh, successively until it reaches the output layer. And then, as you can see here, for example, the output is 17, 28.5, and 4.5. So this is what we call the logits or the prediction vector. And the largest of which, um, so, so we feed this prediction vector through a softmax function, which is just basically a normalization function that um, assigns a probability to each output you, to each output and so you see in this case um, 0 0.57 is the most probable output and so if you can think of each position in this vector as a as a output class um, the this neural network actually predicted that the value for this input is 1 but the correct class is actually 0 so, um, let's let, let's let's look at this again um, this is the first step which I just described, the feed forward step. Um, but in the case that there's an error, for example, uh, here again, the correct answer is actually zero, but the predicted class is one. And then we go to the back propagation step, uh, which is the crux of deep learning. The model made, made a wrong decision. We have to calculate the error and we have to assign blame. Deep learning is all about assigning blame and you have a network that learns things. So you assign blame to different units in, in the network by back propagation, tracing backwards to find the units that, co con that contributed to this wrong prediction and how much they contributed to that total error. You penalize those units by decreasing their weights, by decreasing that, that value of, of W, so that in the future, if the same, if the same, um, input was, was fed in, into this network, then those units would, uh, be, be less responsible for the amount of decision making that this, this network would make. So beyond just simple multi-layer per perceptrons, which is what I just described, there's also more complicated ways to optimize the, the predictions that, that neural nets make. There's this thing called convolutional neural networks, which basically um, is just a way to um, correlate features that are um, geographically correlated. 
So for example, if you're looking at an image, um, this is a pixel vector. It's, it's a pixel matrix. And a convolution is just a kernel that you put on top of the image and shift it around such that you'll get a resulting, uh, a single result for each uh, overlap between the kernel and the, and the input matrix. And this just means that when you're looking at uh, matrices of, of, of pixels, you won't have to look at every single pixel as a different input vector. You'll, you'll be looking at every single group of pixels as a single value. So convolutional neural networks allow us to do layered learning. If you know uh, about, about uh, facial recognition, the, the lower, the lower layers of the network actually recognize very fine features because the, the convolution kernels that are, uh, overlapped with the original input image, um, are able to look at very fine features and are able to group very small features together. So, so if you can see on, on layer one, which is at the very bottom, you can see, uh, things like eyelashes. You can see things like wrinkles on the skin. But as you move up, uh, when you put the Convolution over the previous layers convolutions, then you you're able to see higher level features like the actual eyes, your eyebrows, and things like that. And when you feed that up into a higher layer, then you're able to see um, much more abstract features like the shape of the face and whether your face can, uh, has a mustache or not. And this is exactly how uh, digit recognition or character recognition works. Um, this is one of the most famous and early. Uh, neural networks that successfully had good results for uh, for digit recognition. And a different kind of neural network is recurrent neural networks. Uh, it's just a deep neural net with a feedback loop. So what this means is that you're a instead of learning each particular input as its own vector, you're, the, the previous inputs also also come into also come into play. Previous time steps feed into intermediate steps and final values of the next time step, and it introduces the concept of memory into neural networks. So instead of learning just images and being able to predict what is this input, you're able to predict what comes next, and um, based on patterns in the past, you're able to predict future patterns. So for example, uh, something that make use, makes use of recurrent neural networks would be a text generation engine. Uh, Based on, uh, let's say you train a, a model on the English language or, or, or popular language, then you're able to, to see that um, if a Y comes first, then it is probable that an O would come next. And then if a Y and O was, was previously existing, then an L would come next. And to make good predictions, we need more context. So long-term memory capabilities without extending the network's recursion, uh, cause the, the birth of long short-term memories, uh, which is the core of uh, AlphaGo, which is what um, beat the world's Go champion. So uh, speech recognition has been, has been powered by, by deep learning for, for a long time. Uh, these are, this is just how some of the popular speech recognition algorithms have, have progressed over the years. Um, the different colored lines just represent different kinds of data sets that you would use for speech recognition. Um, the black one represents red speech, which is uh, one of the most clear and, and clearly enunciated data sets ever. And the red ones is, is really the holy grail. It's conversational speech. Um, and this, this data set, I think, actually is from a, a speed dating, um, a, a speed dating re recorded conversation. So, um, I had a chance to, to listen to it and it's, it's pretty, con it's pretty interesting what they were talking about. So the core of the presentation is about how to defeat machine learning and how to, uh, bypass such systems. There are some general concepts that you can use to, uh, to, to, um, power work like that. I think, um, different machine learning models have different nuances and, and different ways that you have to, um, look at it to, to generate adversarial input or to poison the model in, in a way that would cause uh, an unexpected output. But there are just certain, uh, overarching principles that, that, um, you should know and I think is, is important. And that's what this presentation is about. So, one of the most popular data sets for image recognition is the CIFAR10 data set. Um, it's just basically 60,000 really, really small images, each belonging to a, one of 10 classes. So here I have a uh, two sets of pictures, one of a dog and one of a car. Um, and so, you know, it's very pixelated because 
these pixels are 10 by 10. The, the, these images are 10 by 10 pixels large. And the reason why they're 10 by 10 pixels large is because uh, it's to facilitate the training of the model. Uh, if you have ever trained a, a machine learning model before, you'll, you'll understand that training these models take a lot of time. And uh, the more features you have, the more time it takes, and it actually increases exponentially. So having a small number of features enables you to do research fast and, and enables you to uh, train model quickly and to it, and to have smaller and shorter iterations. And so you see like when we e evaluate the dog and, and the, and the, uh, and the car, in this case we're just evaluating the, the dog first. Um, each different example, dog norm, dog at 10, and dog at 1 actually gives different results. And dog at actually means uh, a dog ad is, is actually the original dog image with some adversarial input added to it. So we see the same thing for the automobile. We do automobile at one. Which looks the same. It says it's a cat. So this is this is a, a black box attack, which means that I don't know anything about the inter internals of the network. This is a pre-trained model that I downloaded from the TensorFlow code base. So let's just look at the differences between each of these uh, images. We're just going to read in this, these images and see how different they actually are. To the human eye, they don't look that different. If we if we if we were to just look at these. Uh, with our eyes, and we, we can see that they're actually, they, they look like images that are the same with just a little bit of noise added to it. So this is the the pixel matrix. The shape it's 32 by 32 uh, with three channels RGB. So we see that each each uh, pixel has the minimum value of zero and a max of two five five, which is expected. So we're reading in the at one image for the dog. Okay, so this is also a image matrix. It has the same shape as the normal image. And let's look at the difference by subtracting the adversarial image, um, by subtracting the normal image from the adversarial image. So we see that there's just very small perturbations in each, in each uh, pixel of plus one or minus one or minus two. And to the human eye, you can't tell uh, a pixel 001 and 000 very well. You can't tell them apart. But to a model which actually looks for certain things to learn to recognize that this particular image is a dog, it actually can recognize it and it actually makes a difference to what prediction it makes. So we printed out the difference and it looks like garbage added to the dog image. And that causes the result this, which looks pretty much the same. So it just goes to prove that your eyes can't really tell apart images that are slightly different. But as we saw earlier, the machine learning model thought differently. Now let's just see uh, dog at 10 to see what the difference between dog at 1 and dog at 10 is. Dog at 10 is basically um, a stronger perturbation to the original input that we saw earlier. And if we do the same thing by subtracting the original image from then we see larger perturbations of the input vector. Yep. So we'll come back to, to that a little bit more later. Uh, let's look at some attack tax taxonomy to see where the vulnerabilities are in these machine learning models. There are two kinds of, ge uh, in general, there are two kinds of attacks that you can do on machine learning. One kind is causative and one kind is expl exploratory. So causative attacks actually require you to manipulate training samples. Machine learning is split into two general stages. One is training and one is testing. So 
in in most uh, models, in most models, uh, the training step and testing step are separated. But in some examples that you can see online, uh, for example, in uh, Google Translate, they're actually making use of an online learning uh, system, which basically means that every new uh, prediction that it makes, it, it immediately takes in feedback from the user um, to train the model even more. So for example, when you make a translation and you see that it it did pretty poorly, you can right click and then select the right, the, the right translation for it according to you, a human. And the model will actually take this input and train its model even more. So this is a scenario in which the training and testing step are, 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 are interweaved. Um, but in most cases, offline learning, the training step is separate from the testing step. So you would train a model offline and then you would deploy this model to a web server or, or, or somewhere where, where a user will interact with it. And then, um, if you were to retrain, you have to take in input from uh, other sources to, to retrain this model based off the old model. So causative attacks basically means that you have access to this training stage, which it isn't always the case because these models can be trained privately uh, in your own private servers and users may not ever have access to this training stage. Exploratory attacks are more powerful in the sense that um, the users or the attackers don't necessarily have to have access to the training stage. All they have to have is access to the model, to the testing stage, and feed in adversarial examples, and then they can adjust the output that this, this model gives. And so this is the example that, uh, that I showed earlier, um, whereby we didn't have access to the image recognition model at all. We just fed in a different image that was slightly changed, um, but we were able to force a different output from the model. So why can we do this? Uh, the general principle behind this is blind spots. Machine learning models don't learn the same way that humans do. I think when we talk about deep learning, a lot of people seem to um, think that deep learning systems learn in exactly the same way as humans learn. Uh, but humans don't necessarily look at individual pixel values and recognize and recognize objects like that. What we do is we look for salient features. We look for features that are telling of what um, of, of what this object is, and then we remember this, and in the future, if we recognize these same features again, then we would classify the object as such. But this is actually a really, really tough thing for, for machine learning models to do, because there are just so many rules that we, ha are, that we have grown up with that culture has, has inculcated in us that um, these things cannot be effectively coded into a, a, a succinct model. So adversarial deep learning it's mainly three steps. First thing is to run the input X through the classifier model. And then the second step is to, based on model prediction, derive a perturbation tensor or a perturbation vector that maximizes the chances of misclassification. There are three ways of doing this. I'll go into detail later. And the third step is to scale this perturbation tensor by some arbitrary magnitude. The smaller magnitude you, you scale this by, the less detectable it is to a human looking at it. Uh, but also the chances of it actually tricking the model are, are lower. The, the larger you scale it by, a human will be able to, to detect it, but also uh, it'll be able to trick the model much faster. So the very first way that people, that someone came up with for tricking this model is basically to traverse the data manifold to find blind spots in the input space. Um, adversarial samples are basically pockets in the manifold. So if you can think of all possible uh, pixel variations that make up the image one, for example, um, what we want is for every single different pixel, set of pixels that uh, look like a one to a human to be classified as a one in this machine learning model. But that's not actually the case. So this uh, actually just does a brute force attack and searches for uh, pixels that uh, pixel uh, variations that do not uh, result in a, in, in a correct classification. Um, then there's also uh, another attack just developed last year that uses linear adversarial perturbation as an attack. Develop a linear view of the adversarial examples and you're basically using the cost function gradient of, of the network re with respect to the input sample and the original predicted class to uh, derive a sign for which this perturbation sh should be added to. So for example, if you take the cost function gradient with respect to x and y, and you find that it is positive one, then you just basically add plus one to the entire input. And this would more, more effectively trick the, the, the network. 
And the last one, which is the most effective one, um, is, the, is the Jacobian matrix perturbation way. I won't go into the details of this. There's pretty complex derivations. But basically, this just looks at the saliency map of each image. So this is a 28 by 28 saliency map. And you see that the higher the values of, of perturbation, it means that this network actually looks at this particular pixel m more seriously. Um, and if you change, for example, the center pixel by a, li by a little bit, it'll be much more effective than changing the pixels on the side by a little bit. So the threat model for this is, is, is multifold. Uh, of course, if you have access to the hyperparameters, if you have access to the actual model itself and every value in uh, basically all the weights and biases in, in the network, then you're able to do a lot. However, if you only know the architecture or, or if you only know the training data used to train this network, then you're able to do less. And if you don't know anything about it at all, you only have access to the input and the output, then it's basically a black box. So what can you do if it's a black box? Um, this is just a summary of, of a text. This is the slides we posted later, and, and you can take a look at them. There's some interesting work done um, by, by, by different people um, with different uh, assumptions about the adversarial knowledge and the complexity of the attack as a result. So you can do quite a lot with limited knowledge. Um, Throughout this research, I, I, I did some experiments on how easy it is to bypass machine learning systems when I didn't know anything about it at all. Um, the most important thing is to make good guesses about, about the model. Even if you don't know exactly how the model was implemented or you don't know uh, what kind of uh, neural net was used in this model, you can make good guesses. Image classifications most uh, commonly use convolutional neural networks. Recognition engines most commonly use LSTMs or recurrent neural networks because they need to understand a sequence in the input. Um, for arbitrary machine learning as a service uh, models like Amazon ML or, or Google Cloud Prediction, they use very shallow networks because they need to generalize well. If you have a more shallow network, you're able to, to come up with more generalized understandings of, of arbitrary problems. If you have a deeper network, then your model is more likely to overfit. So if you can't guess, you still can do quite a bit. This is uh, the the last demo that I have. Um, capture is is uh, someone's cool project that was used to recognize image captures. So cap the whole point of captures is that you don't want a bot to be able to automatically solve it. But of course, as you might know, there's lots of uh, things that, that actually solve captures for you. There's even capture solving services like Death by Capture that use some kind of mechanical Turk uh, thing so that someone on the other end of a computer somewhere else in the world can solve the capture for you. But that's not really scalable because like, I don't know many people who are willing to sit down at their computers and earn like half a cent per capture they solve. So um, this actually is a program that uses machine learning and deep learning to recognize images. Even if it looks really convoluted, it's able to give the, the right results. So let me just run this. Uh, just, a, just an example of how deep learning capture recognition engines work. Um, so this is a pretty naive example. Uh, there are many different ways of training a, a capture recognition engine. I'm generating these captures that look pretty, you know, pretty complicated. Like, I would have trouble typing some of these in, and I think a lot of captures in a while are like that. So I'm just regenerating new images just to show that, you know, they're different each time. Um, the, the input characters are just A to Z, so nothing too, too complex. And what, what I'll show is that, um, the capture model eval uh, will be able to 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 recognize this, and the the, the training of this of, of this model is is non uh, is non trivial. So I don't own like a really powerful GPU cluster. Um, if you can see, uh, I started training this like July twelfth at five a.m. five fifty three a.m. And by the time uh, this was done, after a hundred thousand steps. It was July thirteenth at nine a.m. So it's more than twenty-four hours just to train this simple capture recognition system. But the prediction results are pretty good. As you can see, like all the six digits did pretty well. So let's test it on 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 uh, these captures that I just generated. It's pretty slow because there's it's a large model, so it's just using. 
that model for testing. And so each each number in this in this vector represents um, a a, an, an, a letter in in the alphabet. And the actual and prediction. So okay, this this does perfectly. Um, it doesn't always do it like that. Sometimes there's point nines and and point eights in there, depending on the complexity of the of the input. So you can see most of them. I mean, all all of them uh, have the same actual and predicted values, and that's exactly what we expect because this is a well-trained model. Well, it it better do well because I, I think two hundred dollars on the Amazon bills. <laughs> so Amazon has two uh, GPU instances, and um, I think they're uh, two dollars twenty cents per hour for spot instances, and uh, yeah. So if anyone from NVIDIA is here and wants to give me some GPUs, thanks. So this is how, so this is a little bit meta because what we're doing is we're generating captures to trick bots that's, that solve captures. So if you can think about how this would, would be useful, captures are meant to defeat bots. So if you're able to generate captures that can trick the bots that are designed to solve them, then uh, then you've won the game. So these are the the same cap the, the, the same uh, captures that that I generated earlier. Um, we can generate new ones as well, but they're just random generated captures. What we do is we want to generate the adversarial version of these captures. So we're doing that here. Live model is just uh, a model that we pre-train on, on these captures, and then we are going to generate the perturbation vectors that we will add to these to these captures, and then they'll be put into a folder here. So it's also pretty slow because the, the model is large, but let's just do 10, and then we'll test them. So this is the code to generate the adversarial image. It's five lines, literally. And so if, if you look at the, the two sets of images, they look exactly the same. I mean, there's probably some gray spots in there with a, you know, a, a, a difference of, of one, um, but you can't really see them with your, with your naked eye. And let's test it on this. So we're going to evaluate the these these adversarial input, just feeding in the folder, and then we'll evaluate all the all the input images in that. Now this is slightly different from the previous example because there are fewer salient features in this entire input. Uh, an image is pretty complicated, but if you just look at um, a printed character. There's actually not that many salient features that you can extract from these, this. So I would expect the output to be bad, but not as bad as before. So you can see the precision of this is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, which means that at every position, uh, at position 0, it predicted 0 0.1 of the examples correctly. At position 1, it predicted um, 2 of the 10 examples correctly. Actually, at position 3, it predicted 7 out of the 10 correctly. So that's, that's, still, that's still OK. If you can get past seven out of ten captures, it's still okay. But uh, as you can see, just very simply generating capture examples that are that is able to trick a model that's that was previously able to recognize captures correctly at a rate, at a prediction rate of hundred percent, um, it's it, it's pretty easy to do so. So the black box attack methodology in machine learning is a is a um, interesting problem it's still an open area of research and uh, what this is is transferability so if you can think of any machine learning model out there that uses an arbitrary way to make classifications to make predictions um and if you can think of how to generate adversarial, exam adversarial examples for each one of those systems um it's actually not that complicated what people have found empirically is that adversarial samples that fooled model A previously have a pretty good chance of fooling a second model B, even if you have never seen this model before in the past. 
And these models can be anything from, cl from clustering algorithms to SVMs to decision trees to neural nets to linear classifiers to, to even naive Bayes. And uh, this is just some research that another researcher, Papernot, has, has, do has done in the past. And this is a matrix of how well adversarial examples train with another model are able to trick a model that it, that, uh, it was not trained with. So if you can see, um, linear regressors that, uh, adversarial examples generated by linear regressors can trick SVMs with a 91% uh, chance. And deep neural nets generally have a pretty good, um, transferability rating. Uh, if you generate adversarial examples of deep neural nets, you can trick decision trees at a rate of 80%. So that, that's pretty good. And this means that you don't necessarily need to know how a model was implemented to generate adversarial examples for it. You can just generate it with an arbitrary method or with all and try it out and see what does well. And then you're probably going to be right. If you can't do that, then using a substitute model is, is a good way as well. Um, what this means is basically you're training a new model by using the, the black box models output as input examples. So this was used as a method for, um, for, uh, distilling models and, and, and this was used, uh, very, very popularly in mobile phones. When you train machine learning models, eventually you'll get, you, you'll end up with a model that, that is gigabytes large. And this, it's not really practical to put that in a mobile device or your phone because that just takes up too much space or put it in a cloud service because then it just requires too much computation. So this distillation was a method for distilling the important parts of a machine learning model such that, um, the most commonly used uh, parts of the neural network will be kept and the least commonly parts that are seldom activated will, will be just be pruned out. And this was, this was just empirically found to be a pretty good way of uh, generating substitute models as well. So transferability is still an open research problem. Um, this adversarial situation in machine learning is possible because of blind spots and differences between the model and reality. Um, but is this model really not learning anything at all? Uh, I think that's still pretty much an, an open problem. So this means that machine learning models are susceptible to manipulative attacks and can be pretty easily bypassed um, in most scenarios. Uh, you shouldn't make false assumptions about what the model learns and how the model learns. And you should always evaluate the model's resilience to adversarial input before you deploy it in critical uh, scenarios. You should spend some effort to make models more robust to tempering, especially if they're being deployed in critical scenarios like self-driving cars. Uh, there are some interesting papers published in the past um, where if you put a stop sign print up a piece of paper in front of a self-driving car, the car would stop. And if you covered the traffic lights with a piece of cellophane, a human would be able to tell the traffic light is still there, but the self-driving car would not and would not stop. So to defend these machines, three different ways, distillation, uh, you train the model twice and then you feed the outputs into the, into the second model. And this is able to, uh, take out a lot of the, the data manifold, the blind spots that, that exist in the model. You can also train the model by, by, uh, using adversarial input. So this is a little bit meta too, but if you generate adversarial input, uh, from the initial model and then you use this input to train the model again, it'll perform better. And there's also some other more complicated methods like regularization and, and loss function methods that uh, can be used to reduce the impact of adversarial input to, on these models. So what I did was uh, basically have a framework for generating adversarial inputs for machine learning. Um, it's called deep poning. And it's, it's, it's on GitHub. All the code is there. All the code that I used to generate the examples here are, is online. Um, first presented this at DEF CON this year and, um, it's pretty well received and people have started contributing to it. Uh, so there's, there's pretty, there's pretty comprehensive, uh, write up on what you can do with this and how to do it. Um, the purpose of this is, of course, to let people know how easy it is to generate adversarial examples and how easy it is to bypass machine learning models, but also to, 
urge people to start to look at machine learning models with a critical eye, like how you would look at Unix systems and hardened Unix systems, you should also do the same for machine learning models because um, a lot of critical systems rely on machine learning and uh, it is pretty scary how many real systems deployed out in the wild can be bypassed in this, with this simple technique. So as mentioned, train models with adversarial samples for increased robustness is one of the most important takeaways. So please play with it and contribute. And um, uh, deep learning and privacy is also an interesting area that, that I think is, is interesting and needs a lot of research in. Um, a lot of large companies, Google, Facebook, are infiltrating our lives. Uh, Google Home and, and a lot of IoT products that um, that uh, are released by large companies are actually Trojan horses that are used to collect data from us. Um, the more we interact with them, the more data we have, the, the more data that we send to them. But um, you can actually extract a lot of personal information out from deep learning models, e e even though it's unintuitive. So, for example, if there's a voice recognition engine or there's a facial recognition engine that is coded into a machine learning model, such that the model can recognize um, your face from the raw pixels. Even if the actual pixels are not present in the model itself, you can reverse engineer the model to generate your face from that. And that's, that's pretty mind blowing to me. So, as I mentioned, this is important because I think many people in the security industry or even in the machine learning industry are not that concerned about security or machine learning or vice versa. I think that, that needs to change, especially in, in the future where we rely more and more on these systems. And as we place more and more, um, importance on the efficiency of machine learning systems, the efficacy of these systems, and, and how much we trust their results. So um, please uh, contribute to the project, check it out, star on GitHub, and um, that's all I have. Thanks. Any questions? Here. Yeah, okay. So the question is, uh, have I ever tried to reverse engineer the cat detection software to see what the model thinks a cat looks like? Um, the answer is no. I, I haven't done that much research in deep learning and privacy. I think it's a really cool area. In general, it requires a lot of computational power because if you can think of how many, how much time it took for the cat software, the cat model to be trained in the first place, um, and you have to generate examples for what, uh, how many pixels uh, it takes to generate that, that, that cat model. Um, it's, it's actually pretty computationally intensive. So a, a lot of research that's done in the field today is uh, limited by computational power, even though I previously mentioned that adv advances in computation has caused deep learning to explode. But uh, NVIDIA released a deep learning in the box solution that um, sounded really cool, but I, I inquired and it cost $129,000 for that box. So I'm not going to be able to afford that. Okay. Yeah, so that that's pretty interesting. Uh, the question is, how do I describe the attack used on the Tay chatbot that Microsoft released earlier this year? So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Tay chatbot, but it's basically a learning artificial intelligent Twitter chatbot that uh, was able to respond to people's uh, tweets at it and then uh, respond to their tweets and learn from the language that they were using. It quickly be became a racist, homophobic, Nazi bot. Um, and <laughs> I guess that's a... Uh, that's just more of a reflection of Twitter being a cesspool, but <laughs> but uh, I think that that's that's a great example because this is an ex this is an example of uh, causative attacks of, of of causative attacks whereby the model is learning in an online fashion and you're unable to prune results really because there's no human in the loop to 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 uh, help the model learn in the right direction and without a human in the loop machine learning models today can't really decipher what it should and what it shouldn't learn. So I guess uh, it was pretty naive when when they deployed that because, I mean, anything that takes in input um, from Twitter is going gonna, is gonna to end up like that. So not surprising. <laughs> Here.
Yeah, that's that's a great question. That that's that's great intuition. There's um in the in the graph that I showed earlier where uh made up of different different uh work done by different people. Um if you can see here there is a line targeted mis targeted misclassification. Um that just means that you're able to choose a target for where where the classifier will end up. Um so that just means that just means that if an image looks like a one initially and the classifier correctly predicts a one and you wanted it to look like a seven, you can train the model in such a way that um you can add a perturbation vector to this image that would make it look like a seven. And source target misclassification is, is an even more uh targeted way of doing this. You can make ones look like sevens and everything else look the same. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah, this is, this is great. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, please go check out the project online. It's deep honing. And, um, if you have questions or if you want to join or contribute, um, please. Thank you. <laughs>